with pleasure. With pleasure. Okay, good, good morning, everybody. I can start now. Everything is in the control. Good. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure to be here today to tell you about you know, part of my experience, this part of my work on polyploid. I'm a plant geneticist, as uh, Dow already mentioned. Actually, during my whole career, my first publication was in 1976, quite long ago, the Dunia Trisomics, by the way. And since then, I always have been working in this field. So today, I will give my view very much as a biologist, as a uh, uh, cytogeneticist, with interest in chromosomes, genomes, genes, everything. So you will see a mixture of all these kinds of things in the presentation today. So it's of course, it's, it's no need to, uh, to, uh, to explain what polyploid uh, organisms is, but just I mentioned here this very nice definition that in all cases, we carry two copies of each chromosome, and all each chromosome, so the complete sets, which occurs relatively frequently in the plant kingdom. And this morning, when my wife drove me here to the campus, she asked the question, why do they not occur in animal sites, in animal kingdom? That's a very good question. And probably later on, you can ask the question or you give me the answer, why the differences in polyploidy between the plants and the animals? Fine, very nice. Term. Now you see here that we have haploids, bone haploids, I think uh, Professor Fadanara in Plato will talk about it. We have the diploids, and the polyploids are the triploids, the tetraploids, pentaploids, hexaploids, heptaploids, and so forth, until very high levels of polyploidy. In general, you can say <clears throat> that when uh, the number of chromosomes, the number of ploidy is the x, 3x, 5x, so when it is the odd number, then you can expect a lot of problems in meiosis, you can unbalance chromosome segregation, and as a rule, they are most virile. But when you have an even number of uh, genomes, like in the polyploids and the allopolyploids, you can have all kinds of different phenomena that determines that these plants have, uh, let's say, a regular meiosis and a high uh, gamete fertility. Okay, now the first question is, how can we check the polyploids? And actually, I changed the number of criteria uh, yesterday in the last uh, moment. I think by far the best and the most reliable way to detect the polyploid is counting the number of chromosomes and to compare them with other species related to these. So here you see a very nice 40 chromosomes for the diploids and 28 chromosomes for the Tetraploid. And of course, nowadays it's easier, it is faster, it is, I think, even cheaper to determine uh, the polyploid level by flow cytometry, which I'm going to uh, tell about in a while. Plant size stomata. Well, a plant size, as you can say in general, when a plant is polyploid, all organs, leaves, flowers, everything is bigger. And I found this nice example in the internet, in which you can see here that the triploids are bigger than the tetraploids and the, and the, and the diploids. I don't know how much that is in general, but what popped in my mind was in sugar beet, indeed in general, the triploids are far better than the tetraploids and the diploids. That, and of course, for the breeders of, of the triploids, of sugar beet, it is an advantage to have triploids each because the farmer never can repeat, remake the type that they make. So you see that anyway, polyploids have bigger leaves, bigger flowers, everything. And also, if you look at stomata, you see the number of chloroplasts, you can count them and you see the difference between the diploids and the polyploids. Quite Later, I will talk to you also about uh, genetic segregation. Because genetic segregation, especially for autopolyploids, is really different from that of the diploids. And in the end, I will then still a little bit at what 
kind of biomedical tools nowadays are available for the text description of the polypore. Okay, so I promise you to talk about polyploidy uh, shown by uh, flow cytometry. Now, here is a very nice example of a diploid with the 2C and the 4C and the 8C amount of DNA. Well, the 2C amount of DNA actually is the beginning of the interface nuclei, the either the G0, the G1 nuclei, and the 4C are the G2 nuclei. So these two important uh, things are determining, are for you informative to say it is a diploid. And if you then look at the tetraport level, you see that these main peaks, 4C and 8C, they shift to a higher position. Here it is, the 8C is 200, here you see the 8C is, uh, is lower. In other words, you can clearly see that the polyploid, the flow cytometry of the polyploids, if you bend that at higher channels, you flow cytometry. But I include also here the word endopolyploidy because there is a pitfall. There is a trick about looking at the genome size in your plant uh, work. And I found on the internet a really gorgeous example in Lupinus. And you see here a uh, flow cytometric determination of genome size with 2C and 4C in a shoe. It's that clear. But now look at the cotyledon and look at the hypercotyledon. And you see a lot of higher peaks which represent levels of endopolyploidy. endopolyploidy. What are endopolyploidy means that the interface nucleus is doubling its genome size without separating the chromosomes at the mitotic interface. So the nucleus becomes bigger and bigger and bigger without additional mitotic efficient. And the reason why plants do that Insects, by the way, do that also. Mammals do that to far less extent, by the way. Why they do that? That is because in these tissues, specific gene products are required. Specific gene products are necessary. And then to do so, it multiplies the genome to get sufficient messenger RNAs, sufficient, sufficient uh, 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 protein products. So endopolyploidy is actually a transcription factory. It is used for the function of the tissue. As you can see, the cotyledon and the hypercotyledon, they have a lot. And if you look in the roots and in the root tips, you see that you end up simply at a different level and there is no polyploidy. Now let's uh, just mention a couple of, uh, of, uh, of polyploid species. Uh, why culture plants? Simply because culture plants have been studied in genetics, cytogenetic, genomic, and, and of course in breeding. And then you see potato. Professor Watanaba is going to talk extensively about the polyploidy in potato, but also think about coffee, banana, alfalfa, peanut, sweet potato, and I can make this list much and much and much uh, longer. We know that many of the culture plants are autopolyploid, or they can be made autopolyploid. And the chromosome numbers, as you can see here, can be 48, or in coffee, can be a long series of uh, chromosome numbers. Later, I will talk about okra, and okra also has a very large number of different chromosome, oh, size, chromosome numbers. The same holds true for allopolyploid culture plants, or perhaps I have to say, that are even more allopolyploid culture plants than there are autopolyploid uh, culture plants. Now, just to give you an exception, tobacco is a very famous one. Cotton, breadwheat, that's, I am going to talk a bit about breadwheat. It has six chromosome sets, that's six genomes, two A's, two B's, and two D's. Oats also can be uh, uh, composed of uh, six sets. Sugarcane, I'm going to tell you a bit about sugarcane, has a very large number, variable number of uh, genomes. Plum, that is why plum is so difficult to breed. Same for strawberry and apple and pear. Here there are the roses. See, the roses here can be highly polyphoric, very difficult to breed. And you understand why, because there are many chromosomes that can interact with each other. About the origin of the polyploids, interesting to see that uh, uh, 
one way to produce uh, polyploids is by mitotic non disjunction what we call a restitution nucleus. They can occur once in a while, very rare, but in our interest of polyploids, they are only important if they end up somewhere in the germline or if they end up somewhere in a branch that we can isolate and propagate individually, then mitotic non-dysfunction may be interesting. And I mentioned that especially because breeders and plant geneticists can use uh, spindle inhibitor treatments, orizolin, caucasin, to produce these uh, uh, restitution nuclei in mitotic tissue. I think mitotic non-dysfunction, I'm very happy that uh, Professor Watanab is also going to talk about it. In meiosis, you can have non disjunction uh, as well. Now, let's see here in this example if you have two related but different species, one with two chromosome pairs and one with three chromosome pairs. The gametes have half the numbers, and you get here, you get a hybrid, and have one hybrid which has five chromosomes. It is very unbalanced, it's very unhappy, it is very unstable. And one way to escape from the problems is just by genome replication. And you get the so called LO tetraploid individual. Or if you go, you start with the diploid, like with the AA genome, you can go right away to auto tetraploid, and you also can escape from all the problems that may occur. Now, a very nice example. Um, what I have already since the beginning of my, my career are a couple of, uh, of images. Uh, actually, there are uh, movies from a Polish uh, uh, couple, Professor Bajer and Professor Mole Bajer. This is a picture from 1956, quite old and so forth, but it shows very nicely in Amantis Caterina how the effect is of caucasine to produce a restitution, uh, restitution on the Let's see a bit where this one. So you get the normal prophase, as always, very big chromosomes, as this guy, very big chromosomes. And normally what now should happen is that the chromatids separate and go to the poles, but that does not happen because colchicine disturb the formation of a spindle and what happens to chromosomes actually the chromatids they remain together if you are interested by the way in this kind of uh, in, uh, movies i still have a lot and i will be more than happy to uh, to copy them or to give you a copy set so in other words restitutional nuclei can be induced by treatments with focusing or orizolin calling a so-called C mitosis, when you go from the 2X to the 4X level. And by the way, a good question is, how can we see these chromosomes alive in the plant? That is because here we are looking at endosperm. And endosperm is the only tissue in plant which has no well-formed uh, cell walls. So with the phase contrast, you can look in the microscope through all the cells and see what happened with the chromosomes. Now we go to the more complex uh, story of uh, normal reduction in meiosis. I keep it very much to the essential part. So here you have six phases of a normal meiosis in which after pairing and recombination crossovers, you get the separation of complete chromosomes, the actual reductional division at anaphase one, reorientation and metaphase one, and the separation of the chromatids in telophase two, and you end up with four cells in the gametes in the so-called tetra stage. So you, you produce four gametes. An alternative of that is the first uh, uh, division, the FDR, the first division restitution, in which anaphase one was skipped. Quite often when the chromosomes, the homeologous chromosomes, the parental chromosomes, have difficulties to, uh, to pair and recombine, you can see that several plant species have the ability to skip this version of the first efficient restitution. And you see at metaphase two, you see here the double chromosome sets, 
you get the chromatin separation of telophase, and you end up with two unreduced gametes, what we call 2N gametes. Now, what is interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it because it's quite complicated, but for those who like to know, you can see that the gametes here, to a great extent, are heterocyclic. So with FDR, first efficient restitution, you keep a greater part of heterocycosity. That is not the case with second efficient restitution. Meiosis is normal until telophase or anaphase telophase 2, which is skipped. And here you can see that the chromosomes do not separate in the chromatids. And again, you have two N gametes. And here now you can see that homozygosity is retained to a greater uh, extent. So there are two major differences between FDR and SDR. First is when it takes place at anaphase 1 or anaphase 2. And the second is the level of heterozygosity. That is a very interesting feature, by the way. Okay, now a, a nice example of what we see in the microscope for unreduced gametes. You can see here, left in the top, these are uh, very big diets with uh, uh, cells, gametes that are double as large. But you also can see it in the pollen grains. And a beautiful uh, uh, cytoflow, uh, flow cytogram here, you can see. If you have uh, three species, these are the diploids. And if you make the amphidiploid, the amphidiploid is still out, unless you have unreduced gametes, and then you get the double size of the pollen grain. So it's a very nice method to isolate successful pollen grain in this way. I would like also to mention some aspects that we studied here, actually, um, that my colleague. Uh, uh, Hugo Volkart study here in, uh, in this lab. And that is to tell you a bit more about what happens in nature. Now look at an LO triploid Rulai Bakhtuan banana, which according to morphological information, taxonomic information, should be a hybrid between A, B, and I banana. Now A is Musa Actinata, AA. BB genome is Musa Baldiciana. And the I genome is Musa Itinero. Now, there are one way to demonstrate it is that you have this cross in, in the nature and you get this amphi haploid, right, an AI hybrid, which is very unhappy, will be sterile, unless it circumvents the problem of sterility by pollen, uh, uh, unreduced pollen. Then you have an A and an I plus the B of the mother, and you get the B A I. Hugo asked me some time ago to think together about the phenomenon. Now you can work out, and I can tell you there are 12 possible explanations to end up somewhere with an allo triploid ABI, BIA, and so forth. But the very interesting thing is, Hugo also told me that chloroplasts transmit only through the female. From the, from the BB, that is what has been established by the information, by the analysis. So in other words, this is possible. This combination is possible. If you have A as the female, you will not be able to, uh, to uh, explain this. The mitochondria, however, they transmit through the male from the eye genome. This is, for me, it was really a shock because I know that chloroplast and mitochondria as a rule, only transmit to the female side. Although breeders told me that a cucumber, you also can have transmission of these chloroplasts to the male side. So there are exceptions. Now, it is it, this is a very fascinating study, I have to say. Hugo told me that he's now analyzing genes on all the 11 chromosomes, one by the other, and seeing is the chromosome from A, is it from B, or is it from I. Very interesting. Then, because breeders know that you can escape from sterility in the hybrid, people are very keen, very eager to know which chemical or physical treatments are successful to restore, to make a restoration of male sterility. 
And one example is that you take an amphiploid lily, amphidiploid, sorry, amphidiploid lily, and you can treat it with laughing gas for 48 hours. And then you get a lot of meiotic restitution or mitotic amphidiploidization. How you can see that? Quite easy. If you don't do the treatment, you see here that the pollen is sterile. If you do the treatment, you can see here some pollen are much bigger, well filled, meaning that these pollen grains escape from fertility and they are unreduced. So a very nice example. You also can see it here from the pollen at a lower magnification. If you have fertile, if you have fertile pollen, you get beautiful growth of the pollen tube. In other words, restoration can be done with uh, a laughing gas. There are many more. Uh, chemical treatments that you can do. You can keep with a heat shock, that is also possible. And there are several genes that are known also to treat, uh, to cause meiotic restitution. So that people know there are a lot of different uh, mechanisms. I don't know, uh, Professor, if you're going to talk about ways how to uh, uh, to, to induce, uh, unreduced, well, uh, unreduced gametes. But anyway, it's good for you to know that there are many ways to do this artificially. Now, in nature, I already mentioned a little bit in nature, we have all kinds of polyploids. We have a lot of polyploids, we have to say that. And what people thought for a long time is that polyploids are simply the result of diploid A and diploid B. You get a, bit, a polyploid and so forth. Nowadays, we know, and I, I, if you talk with Ufo about the banana story, you will say there are likely many more hybridization in nature. There are many more different genotypes involved, giving, let's say, a plethora of different uh, hybrids, giving rise to also a different sort of hybridization. So the hybridization is very, very complex indeed. Now, my hobby, one of the things that I like very much, if you talk about polyploidy, you know it is easy for every species to increase the polyploidy level either by autopolyploidization or hybridization and come up to a higher level. We cannot go on with this, this process because we may induce plants with thousands and, and thousands and thousands of chromosomes. That is what will happen. Even more, I realize that in plant species, most of the crops, most of the plant species have a basic chromosome, a number somewhere between five and 20, which means there's a superiority, there's an advantage of not having too many chromosomes. There's a nice paper, an old paper from Professor De Wet, what he called uh, a poly diploid, polyploid, diploid cycle. And what it means very much in general is that when you start with a diploid, mitotic or meiotic restitution will give rise to an auto polyploid, an auto tetraploid in this case. Or you can have a hybridization with a related uh, genome, with a related subspecies or species, and you end up with an allo polyploid, like this case, AABB. Now, what Barbara McClintock, I, mean, I, I think you all are aware of the work of Barbara McClintock, who actually found transposable elements. She said that when you make this kind of process, you end up with what she called a genome shock. What well, is a genome shock? You create a genome in a new, newly formed allopolyploid or autopolyploid in which the chromosomes are not happy, they are not balanced. And the result of the genome shock means that you get an epigenetic resetting. You see that some regions are uh, epigenetically released, others are, are getting epigenetically uh, imprinted. So you see a lot of uh, changes in the in epigenetic landscape and if you have things like that it means very importantly that in some places transposons start to activate they are no longer suppressed and they can jump from one place to the other and so forth if transposons start to jump it means you can have chromosome loss substitution and you can have translocation and inversion and even due to epigenetic dynamics you can have what we call the formation of new centromeres, neocentromeres. But most importantly is that 
in the diploid, sorry, in the polyploid, you get loss of chromosome, your, uh, chromosomes. You also get loss of genes because you don't need many copies of genes. You just have two, two genes, two alleles of the genes, two copies of the genes. In general, found that is enough. So you see that many genes are getting redundant. And because they are redundant, they get lost, they get silent, and they get, they get generated, and they simply they, they disappear. So you see also by translocation that, let's say, the 4X goes step by step back to the 2X level. And now we have the beautiful diploid, polyploid, diploid cycle. Do we see that? Yeah, we see that also if we look at the known value of polyploidy in plants. I will show another picture of this later on. There are many cases, proven cases, in which recently in the evolution of polyploids that I polyploidy have occurred. Now we can do a, 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 a bit tougher part, and, and also I'm very happy that the Professor Patanaba is going to talk about that, and it is about the genetics of the autotetraploids. Why all the genetics of the autotetraploid? Because here you have four chromosomes that can take part into chromosome pairing and that can take part in crossover formation. Just to mention, if you have a diploid situation for every gene, which is heterozygous, you have two alleles, capital A and small a, in the segregation of meiosis, you get a simple, what we call a disomic segregation produced capital A and small a can meet in the ratio one to one. But if you have an auto tetraploid situation, you can see here with the, with the genotype, capital A, capital A, small a, small a, in the selfing, you get the tetrasomic segregation. You can see that also here, in this case, capital A, capital A gives you this one, this capital A with that one gives you that. Then you have also these two recessive, small a, small a, and you have uh, eight heterozygous gametes. So you get a very tetrasomic inheritance. I think Professor Bartanaba used the one for one segregation, but that is, of course, the same as the two A2 segregation. We talk about it here. We talk about the tetrasomic inheritance. Tetrasomic inheritance. That is this story. In the diploid, as I said, the two gametes are uh, uh, at the proportion of. Uh, then, if you have an autotetraploid, you get three different classes the homozygous, which is uh, 0.17, you have the recessive, which is also 0.17, and the age out of 12 is 0.67% uh, of uh, gametes. And in the autotetraploid, we will solve, I come to explain it in a while, we will solve this problem because in the autotetraploid, chromosomes behave like diploid. So we say in genetical crosses, in an autotetraploid, we have generally spoken, okay, I know there are many exceptions, that an autotetraploid, we have disomic inheritance. The simple disomic inheritance we see here, the tetrasomic inheritance, and finally, in the allotetraploid, the disomic inheritance. Now, a little bit more explanation about it. I'm going to show you some pictures of this beautiful Prelus cancer virginiana, virginiana. For every chromosome, it is an autotetraploid, by the way, we have quadriplets for every chromosome. We have two chromosomes that what we call are identical. There is no allele difference. So we have the light ones, the dark ones, but the light one compared to the other one is called a homologous. So we have two sets of homologous, two sets of identical. Later, we are going to talk to introduce the term homeology. Now, if you have one set of four chromosomes, and you look in the electron microscope, this is going to be the most beautiful that I ever made in my, uh, in my career, so I'm more than happy to show you. This is an electron micrograph of four pair chromosomes, and you see here one arm of two chromosome arm. These are the centromeres in which chromosomes uh, have a bearing partner exchange. See the second, the third, and the fourth arm. And every arm has uh, what we can see in the electron microscope 
as a crossover event, which we call a recombination nodule. But that is a detail I'm not going to uh, discuss. Okay, now we come to exception number one in the autotetrapoid story. And that is the story of preferential pairing. If you look again in the uh, in the Pralaskantia virgiliana, you look at diakinesis metaphase one, you end up with uh, six sets of four chromosomes. Do we always see sets of four chromosome configurations in all the four chromosomes paired together, cross over together? And the answer is no. Here you see one very nice example, one, two, three, four chromosomes, no doubt. But the others, one and two, one and two. So you see a lot more difference than you would expect on the basis of pairing. You would expect six foot difference. You do not see that. You even see sometimes uh, a configuration of three chromosomes. Here, right, you see it's prevalent, and you see a univalent. And the univalents are one of the guys who make the big problem. So to make a fairly general statement, if you have four chromosomes, two identical and two homologous chromosomes, you can end up with uh, this kind of quadrifluence, prevalence, benevolence, as we have seen there, and we can see all kinds of bivalence. If you assume that this chromosome pairing and recombination is an entirely random process, you can expect on the basis of uh, this random pairing one, two, three, four, five, six cases of bivalence and one, two, three pairs of, of bivalent pairing, of bivalent pairs. Now, you will see that you can already see in this example, although this is not sound, here you can see that there are many more pairs than you expect. So for random pairing and crossovers, two-thirds are quadrivalent and one-third are bivalent pairs. And if there are many more bivalents, or clearly more bivalents, you talk about preferential pairing. Now, what is preferential pairing? It means that the identical chromosome have a tendency to produce more pairing and crossovers than the combination between the chromosome and its homologue. Or you have a preferential pairing between the homologues and not between the identical. It is not always one or the other, it is a random process. So we see preferential pairing, it means that uh, there is a sort of mechanism to, uh, to make sure that either the chromosomes or the homologous chromosomes or the identical chromosome love to pair and recombine. And that is again what you see here in the chromosome segregation of this plant. You see what is the what is the problem? The problem is the univalent to start with. Not not uh, the bivalent. <coughs> here what I made in red, you can see this chromosome pair, it will disjoin beautifully taxonomically. One chromosome could this, this pole, the other chromosome could go to the other pole. The problem, however, can be the, 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 the configurations of three chromosomes and especially the univalent. Because the univalent does not know if it goes to this pole or that this pole. Well, in this particular cell, you can imagine that this one will go to that pole together with that. Okay, that is valid. But in many cases, you can see that segregation of univalent are the reason for unbalanced gametes. And that is here a nice example in the top. You see here this same uh, transcantia and anaphase one. 12 chromosomes go to this pole, 12 chromosomes go to that pole, giving rise to a balanced gamete. But quite often you see, like in this case, you see 12 to one pole and 10 to the other pole. And here in the middle, you see the two chromosomes stick together. It is not what I tell many people, there is an inversion. Here is no inversion. There can also be sort of stickiness process. So you see what happens. This will give you viable pollen. This will not give you fine pollen because well, probably this will, but this certainly will not because it is a gamete that is lacking chromosomes. So this is an unbalanced gamete. So we see in the autotetrapoids, several things can go wrong. To, to help the process 
of balanced chromosome segregation, there is this mechanism of preferential pairing. What you see in a very young autotetraploid, you have not so much preferential pairing, you have a lot of rubbish, you have a lot of unbalanced gametes, and in the evolution, in later generations, what you see is that there's a tendency to increase preferential pairing. I even may say so, this is a sort of natural selection for more preferential pairing. Why? Because more preferential pairing means that you have more balanced gametes. And there is one other point, and I must be very careful because many people find it very difficult. But sometimes you see if you have a, a, a gamete from a duplex AA, capital A, capital A, small a, small a, you get this kind of combination, right? But if you have what we call a triplex autotetraploid, capital A, capital A, capital A, small a, you would expect that none of the gametes are small a, small a, like 6, 6, 0. However, you do find once in a while with certain genes that there are still some gametes with a double recessive uh, gene. And that is what people call double reduction. Double reduction was first described uh, in trisomics, in primary trisomics, but actually the phenomenon of double reduction can also be observed in autotetraploids. And the double reduction is a beautiful phenomenon of what people later learn about consequence of chromatin exchange. Now, what happens actually in meiosis? You have here the four chromosomes, the sets of four chromosomes, two with the capital A and two with the small a. If you have a crossover between the homologs, you end up with two non-crossover chromosomes, no recombination chromosomes, and you get two recombination chromosomes. Okay, the chance for a gene which is very much at the distant chromosome, you can say chance for a crossover is one. Okay. In general, it is far less than one, but let it be one. Now you see that there is also a chance that the two chromosomes with the chromatid exchange here, with the uh, go to one pole and the others go to the other pole. If you if you carefully uh, uh, if you are going to uh, calculate, then you see one third of the questions. You see the situation, one third of the situation. Okay, so you have the two recombinant chromosomes here with the exchange of chromatids, and here you see the two non recombinant chromosomes. And then again, you have a probability that the end of phase two, the two non recombinant chromosomes go to one pole, as you can see here. So you, so you can explain why sometimes you have the recessive, the small a, small a gametes, what you do not expect. Is this nice? Yeah, it was very nice for people because people understand more about meiosis. And another thing is, it happens only with genes that are far away from the centromere. So if you have somewhere a locus which is very close to the centromere, you will never find the reduction. So you do a very simple centromere mapping in this experiment. Okay, so we see in a summary. We have a number of complications in autotetraploids and autopolyploids. First, you see the loss of univalence, simply because they give rise to unbalanced gametes. You have a variable rate of preferential pairing. If it is a very strong preferential pairing, you have a disomic inheritance. If it is not, you get a tetrasomic inheritance. Sometimes, for genes that are at the end of the chromosomes, you get the phenomenon of double reduction, and then to correct for all these kinds of things, there is a special linkage programs are needed for mapping uh, linkage groups in the autotetraploid. And again, it is difficult, very difficult for breeders to work with autotetraploids, like uh, Professor Vatanava will explain uh, later on after my presentation. Okay, so towards genetic mapping of the autotetraploid, just to mention how difficult it is. If you have no molecular markers, if you have just very simple markers, for every locus, if it is heterozygous, you have five different cases. All four have the blue allele, all four have the red allele, and you can have the simplex, duplex, and the triplex. 
this is literally facts, this is that effect. This is just how you probe these kinds of things. So in other words, you need very um, special software, complicated software. I remember that 10, 20 years ago, this was really a big effort for the breeders in my university to do the job. But nowadays, it's a, 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 a several mathematical geneticists they great work in developing software and I strongly suggest you to look at the, the, the paper of uh, Peter Borke in Frontiers of Plant Science 2018. If you can't get it, send me an email. I'm more than happy to send you the copy. And there you have an overview of all kinds of uh, uh, tools, bioinformatic tools that have been, uh, have been developed. The most important thing that people nowadays can use is molecular marker, SNPs. And you are not looking at a single SNP, as you can actually see here, where you end up with five different classes. So you combine information of SNP1, SNP2, SNP3, in what people call actually the haplotype. And the haplotype is a small piece of molecular DNA in which you combine information of several uh, SNPs. And then you have all of a sudden, if you do this small and simple sequencing, you have the information of very easily recognize all the cases of segregation of alleles in the offspring. In other words, you can create haplotypes for every chromosome. So with this software, you end up in, 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 in potato, you end up with four lineage groups. And the second is in the traditional, in the old way of making things groups, we're looking at recombination, the crossover. Where are the crossover recombination and we divide by the total? In the modern, in the new algorithms, what people actually do, what geneticists do, they look only for, for loci that are always or almost, almost always are linked together. So you look for a very strong linkage, and with this strong linkage, you can um, you can extend your linkage map in the left side and the right side, and so you can make this kind of genetical map. So, do you have uh, problems with uh, preferential preferential pairing and uh, and double reduction? Actually, not. You can reduce the problem that arises with that using this kind of uh, genetical linkage mapping algorithm. I mentioned already in the other polyploids where we have uh, an ancestral genome composed of genomes related, you see that uh, by gene duplication, translocations, you get all kinds of rearrangements. And when you bring these together, you get an other polyploid species in which the parental, the original parental chromosomes are so different that, let's say, a tetrasomic inheritance no longer can take place. See in the L polyploids a very nice example of a disomic inheritance. I now take uh, the liberty to tell you a bit of about well known L polyploids. The first, I hopefully we all know about it is bread wheat, it is an AABB and an ED genome, and related to that is the tetraploid durum wheat or macaroni wheat, which is an LO. Tetraploid, and actually also in the eastern part of uh, of Europe, a lot of farmers use Tritikele, which is an AABBDDRR. So it also has brought together the R genome and the V genome. And why do people do that? Because rye as a plant is much; it has not such a high yield. It's not so interesting. But what is interesting about rye is that this tolerance. To, uh, to poor soils and, and, and low acidity of the soils. So bring this together, you can grow the treaty kale on regions in land, which is not suitable or very suitable for wheat. So you see here the AA, BB, D, and R are brought together. The meiosis is very, very disomic, and still breeders are very interested to integrate important genes from related species into the wheat genome, into crescent hybridization. I'm going to talk about it in a while. So you see very well 
that there is a need for homeologous recombination. Can we do that? And we actually not. Until in the 70s of last century, I thought it was uh, Professor Sears who found a mutation on chromosome 5 of the B genome, the so called PH1. I'm not going to talk about this, but the story is nice enough. And if PH1 is missing, <clears throat> or if it is recessive, then you see that the suppression of homeologous recombination no longer takes place. And not only the homologous chromosome can pair and recombine, also the homeologous chromosome can pair and recombine. Is that an advantage? It is an advantage for the breeder to see if he can get incorporation of desirable genes from other species into the wheat. But what is the consequence for this disadvantage is that meiosis is a big mess. And you get a lot of infertile pollen. You get a lot of sterility. <clears throat> the second example, what I love also to talk about with my students, is the famous triangle of the Korean geneticist reader, Yu. It is simple, it's one letter, but that is how the guy is called. And you have in Brassica, you have the A, sorry, the A here, Brassica rapa, Brassica oloracea, and Brassica nigra. And between all these in nature, allo polyploid, uh, allo tetrasome, etro tetraploid hybrids were formed like Brassica napus, very important, also in, in agriculture, Carinata and Brassica juncea as the AAVV genome. So you see very nicely you have three allotetraploids and three diploid species. Are the diploid really diploid? We will see. They probably are not. Few examples from my research that I did here in uh, partly in complex things. The first is an analysis together with former PhD student here in complex things about one of the sugarcane uh, uh, meiosis. And sugarcane, this sugarcane has uh, 110 chromosomes, it's a highly polyploid uh, species. And not my work, but the work of the French group in uh, Montpellier is that they. Uh, analyzed the genome and he said now a small number of chromosomes are originally from from saccharum spontaneum most of the chromosomes are from saccharum of this item, and a few chromosomes are genuine recombination chromosomes resulting from homeologous recombination now if you want if you have time you can count the number but they are about 110 if you look at meiosis here in the pairing well look at the, a little bit of the magnification, you can see that there are some exchanges between all kinds of chromosomes. For me, the most informative picture is this so-called uh, method page one. You can see here, if you see on the bottom, and if you magnify several chromosomes, you are see very nice difference, but you also see several multivalents showing or explaining why you actually have these recombination chromosomes. In other words, you see here an allopolyploid with a large number of chromosomes in which the, 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 the parental chromosomes are able to recombine. <clears throat> so it is clear, I talk with the breeders, what they do essentially, they make breeding between two interesting parental stocks, parental traits, they make a very large offspring and they test all these offspring sugar cane one by the other for disease persistence, for sugar content, and so forth. <clears throat> also, here you can see that the meiosis, here you see a lacking chromosome, here you see that the chromosomes are probably not entering the anaphase. So, not surprisingly, you get a lot of endoprobity. Interesting is my next example, which I did on the request of my colleagues of East West Seeds, and that is okra. Okra was not known to me very famous in India and Africa, but also grown more and more now here in Thailand. And uh, this okra, thanks to the help of, uh, of Dao, this beautiful plant, probably you remember, we went to an agriculture area uh, just outside uh, uh, Kampeng Seng, where the farmer grows uh, its okra. Hmm. Well, the first question 
that the people of East West he asked me how many chromosomes have you, do you have in this okra? Well, 2n equals 130. That's a lot. You want, you can count them. But the big surprise is that I collected several plants here at home in Kampek Seng. I did the cytogenetics, the chromosome counting in Wageningen. And most of the plants had 130 chromosomes. And then in one of the one of the samples that it took, I counted 65 grams. So I contacted East West Seeds immediately. I said, among your seeds that you sent me in your in your gold bar sample, one plant is haploid. Haploid, 65 chromosomes. Well, I can tell you there was an explosion in Chiang Mai because this was a unique opportunity. Not only for the breeders, because if you have a haploid, you can double it. But Die have for it, they have a higher level of homozygosity. But the other thing is, we were interested to sequence this guy. We sequenced, by the way, this guy, and we end up with 65 pseudochromosomes of this highly polyploid species. So you see here that with cytogenetics and a lot of luck, you can produce haploids. Not only this one, I found one, but the original plant died. In the meantime, they looked for more uh, haploids and they found in, uh, in, in Chiang Mai several other haploids, of which one was used for DNA analysis. Well, the chromosomes are very small, as you can imagine, compared to the uh, Hermantis and the Lily and the, and the Pralostantia, which, by the way, are huge chromosomes. But this is a very small chromosome. So you will not be surprised that even with 130 chromosomes, you have a genome size of only 1.45 giga base pair, which is quite small. The big surprise was that if we uh, analyze the meiosis of the okra cultivar, that meiosis here is very regular. You see, if you this is an, what we call a diagenesis just at the end of the prophase, and this is a bifolin, that is a bifolin, that is a bifolin. That is different. You can say the majority of the chromosomes just form very neat bivalents. There are not multiplens. And that is a great advantage because it shows that pollen grains are very, very, I would say, very uh, normal, very regular. They all have the same size. The fertility is very high. And we conclude that the meiosis in this ultra cultivar is very disomic. So in other words, in a, in a nutshell, you see that um, meiosis and breeding in sugarcane, as we all know, is very difficult. And producing a new cultivar through seeds is impossible. But okra, on the other hand, is very disomic. In spite of a very large number of chromosomes, it produces a uh, very fertile and, and uh, beautiful uh, well stained the pollen grains, which demonstrate that this guy here is disomic. That brings me to uh, to the next chapter. What breeders really want to do after in situ hybridization, if you if you bring two species together, and we do this kind of things a lot, also in Wageningen, we want desirable genes, desirable traits from a wild species to integrate by gene transfer into the crop species, what we call intergressive hybridization. We start with interspecific hybridization, in which gamete sterility is mostly a big problem. You even need embryo rescue to, to rescue the F1 hybrid, but in most cases people can do that. And then the hybrid can be used for recurrent backcrosses to the crop, in which you diminish the amount of wild genes and wild uh, uh, wild DNA, wild chromosome material. Every generation, you test for the gene of interest. That can be mostly um, resistant to a, to a certain gene, to a pathogen, resistant to a disease. So that is what is happening all the time with this material. I give you a couple of uh, examples. Years ago, we produced uh, plants uh, that are monosome, well, monosomic, 
for one tomato chromosome in the potato background, you can see here, I make here a funny picture, it is not reality, but we brought one, we created the plant, which finally has one tomato chromosome. Are we happy with it? The answer is no, we are not happy with it. Why not? Because the tomato chromosome is not prepared to uh, pair with one of the potatoes. And you know the answer. Why does this not happen? Because we have a very strong preferential pairing between the potato chromosome, leaving the tomato chromosome aside. So you see here, we can bring them together. Less, far less than 50% of the gametes will carry this uh, tomato chromosome. It will not interpret into the potato chromosome. If you need interpression, if you are eager to look for homeologous recombination, for recombination between tomato and potato, it is best to look for the homeologous recombination in the first phase of your interest hybridization. And that is in this phase, if you have an F1. I know you have a lot of rubbish, you have a lot of lethality uh, and can meet sterility, but this is the stage in which you have some chance that the homologous, homologous chromosomes can pair and interact. Not when you are here in the final phase of the monosomic addition. Now the same is here in the in in, in the disomic addition of wheat. Beautiful wheat chromosomes and the rye chromosomes are, are stained with an oligo, a rye specific oligo, and you see here they are complete and do not recombine with the wheat. Sometimes by irradiation or the effect of pH one, you can force homeologous recombination and you get homeologous recombinant chromosomes like that. I also would like to mention I'm involved in a leak program in Bartlingen in which we intercress leak. Leak is an allium, it's not grown here in the in the in the Thai market, but these are allium species with the uh, very thick plants, very thick plants, and so my very favorite in Northwest Europe because you use the vegetable not only as a vegetable but also in, in soup. Anyway, leek or allium forum is uh, very sensitive to specific uh, diseases like trips, and people make uh, many efforts to cross it with wild relatives like the allium eduardii in an effort to see if we get homeologous recombination. We do see some homeologous recombination, in spite of the fact that the two parental species are not related. They don't love, they don't like each other. But here you see there is not a one crossover. So again, here you see that uh, chromosome study, chromosome painting can give us insight to what extent homeologous recombination takes place to interpret desirable genes into the crop species. Now, my final few slides are a bit more about the uh, genomic. Some time ago, uh, one of my PhD students worked uh, with uh, Brassica odoracea, or to be more precise, with cauliflower. We were very interested in cauliflower. And probably you know that uh, the, the diploid Brassica species have now been sequenced and you can compare the sequences of these brassicas with Arabidopsis. I mentioned to you the brassica species that we are looking at are diploid. Are they diploid? Well, very interesting. Let us just take one example. You see here, if we compare the 10 chromosomes of brassica odoracea with the five chromosomes of, uh, of Arabidopsis, we see here in this, what we call mama plot, we see that a part of chromosome A2 is, uh, is uh, morphologous, is identical to chromosome 5. We see a second one of chromosome A3, and we see also a part here on chromosome 10, but this is blue, indicating that we have an opposite orientation. So here you have not only uh, two inversions, you even have here a small translocation. Now I can go on here. Also, there is, this part is duplicated here in this chromosome, but is partly inverted and so forth. So you see, every segment 
of prostate tolerantia occurred three times compared to the genome of uh, Arabidopsis thaliana. So you see clearly that was a, a reason triplication of the genome in Brassica compared to Arabidopsis. And even in Arabidopsis, you will see a lot of duplication. So it depends on how far back you go in the evolution to see what happens. And then you see, but this is a much nicer picture that I, sh that I showed you again, is a paper of a few years ago, of one in also in the frontiers in genetics. You see here a very nice um, result of a discussion of where people analyzed all kinds of polyprobity shown in the genomes of several plant species. And not surprisingly, you see a lot of paleo polyprobity in these uh, in these species. So the, the, the genomics part, as we all know, helped us a lot better to understand how these uh, genomes are related to each other. And then the final example I really would love to mention, and that is maize. And why do I like to uh, mention maize? Because in the 70s, I went to a chromosome conference in London, and my colleague Mike Bennett, he was that, he was the keeper of Jordan Laboratory, you probably know that in Kew Gardens. And he mentioned to me that if I analyze the chromosomes of maize in the mitotic anaphase, I see that they form two circles of five chromosomes, in which all the five chromosomes are always aligned in a specific order. Not one, there are two circles. He said it must be originally a tetraploid. It was in the 70s, done simply by looking in electron micrographs on how chromosomes are oriented in the anaphase, in the anaphase, microbic anaphase. Far later, we see that by uh, means of all kinds of uh, bioinformatic tools, we see indeed that every gene occurs two times. In other words, maize, although genetically a perfect diploid, was actually a very decent LEO tetraploid. Was a polypoid. If you compare it with rice, you can see that every segment occurs two times in the genome. You also can see it here. Here's the recursion. This part occurs here. This part occurs there, and so forth. If you work it out, you see the complication of polyploidy followed by inversions, translocation, and so forth. <clears throat> so that is what genomics nowadays can reveal to us. In other words, if you are interested in analyzing the, the polypore plant genome sequence, that is what we did recently, also in okra with the 130 chromosome pairs. We have a couple of difficulties. First of all, we need very advanced next generation sequencing by mapping, uh, <clears throat> by, by uh, for the assembly of the small DNA fragment. We start with Illumina with that, uh, Park Bio and several other ways. We did optical mapping, finally to bring everything together and to make uh, chromosomes together, to make pseudochromosomes, huge scaffolds that encompass the complete chromosome. So you need to reduce the complexity of the plurality. And that is what we did in Okra. We used haploids, say 65 chromosomes. Then you reduce the complexity. Although okra is not highly heterozygous, it helped a lot in the sequence. And my colleague, Peter uh, Sanders, he, uh, he told me on a certain moment, he said, Hans, I said, I have here about 120 pseudochromosomes with a telomere on one side and a telomere on the other side. And everything is continuous, it is not a gap. I said, Peter, congratulations. You have the DNA sequence of a complete chromosome. And almost all chromosomes were assembled as complete pseudochromosomes with a telomere on one side and a telomere on the other side. There were a few chromosome arms left, and likely these are the chromosomes. We have a telomere on one side, and we have the ribosomal gene on the other side, with not or not much produced telomere sequence. 
The second is what you can do in a genomic effort is you can compare the genomes of this highly polyphored species with um, a diploid progenitor or another crop species which is not far away but already very well sequenced. Now, when you think about okra, do you have any idea which sequence we can use? It is a Malta C. So, cotton would be absolutely your first choice. Cotton is very well sequenced. And if you compare okra with cotton, you have a lot more tools to make complete assembly possible. And cacao, by the way, is the second one that can help you a lot. So that is what we did in the end, successful de novo sequencing and assembly of large allopolyploid genomes of crops. We can do it now with the modern and new tools, but it is a long way, it is an extensive, and it is also an expensive way to do so, but we end up with the brilliant numbers of pseudomolecules, long pseudomolecules. And that brings me to my final slide. I've given you, I've saturated you with a lot of information, and I think now, and, and it is now time for questions online and on site. Please go ahead. And Punya V has a question. Now, the first thing I can say in the, for most plant species that I know, chloroplasts and mitochondria only transmit through the female line. I know from breeders that cucumber has transmission also through the male side. What I know is that polar grain of, of, uh, of cucumber are very, very big. Also in, in banana, very big. But I look at uh, Hugo. Can you give an answer to the question of uh, your view? <clears throat> that is what we see. Yes. Yeah. So there's no question why some uh, in some species probably it has to do with the size of the of the male gamete, but it's an idea and has never been substantiated. So thank you. Hugo, did I tell you part of the story in a correct way? It is more complicated, I know. It's far more complicated. But if it is not complicated, it's boring, and then we are not interested. So the banana story, the banana story is really very fascinating. What I did not mention, but what we see in uh, by molecular cytogenetics in hybrids, what happens is that you get chromosome substitution. So one of the homo homologous chromosomes transmit better than its own copy. And then you see that one of the chromosomes or more chromosomes are substituted by its homeolog. And that is probably what we think is happening in banana as well. But well, actually, to give a little bit uh, an introduction to your work, banana is so extremely complicated, especially because the acuminata, the A genome, is just doing what it wants. And the B genome is uh, closer to the to, to the laws of nature and probably the eye genome, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of promiscuity, let me say it that way. And and, and you hope, please uh, correct me if I'm incorrect. You know my class of, uh, you, you know what I always say in the journal, club, eh? There are not stupid questions. There are only stupid people who don't dare to ask a burning question. <laughs> I don't want to be personal, doubt.
Yeah. Thank you. You have a very good question. What what you ask is how much microscopy is needed to make sure that you have 130 copies. The the answer is that uh, it depends on the quality of your of your chromosome spread. First, if you have a beautiful preparation, you are more you are easier satisfied than when you have a bad preparation. In okra, the material that I collected here in the complex thing, I analyzed in the, in in Wageningen, was of high quality. High quality means that chromosomes uh, produce a lot of mitosis, so I could find several mitosis, and then I count the chromosomes, and if I have different root tips, all of them show one of the third chromosomes, I'm happy. But in a higher polyploid species, to discourage a little, little bit of also what I said, if you have clumping of the chromosome, if you have overlapping of the chromosome, if, you're, if your technique is so rigorous that you break chromosome, you are not so certain about how many chromosomes you have, right? And then you need more observations to make sure that what you did is correct. Are you not happy? With that answer, at least. The, the answer is yes. Some species do it by nature more often than other species. When I talk here about uh, the occurrence of polyploids in a nature, you can say you can wait for millions of plants and offspring to get one. One probably one probable problem is that when you get unreduced gametes, which is an natural but rare phenomenon, right, you end up with triploids. So most, because if you have an unreduced gamete in the male or the female side, right, then uh, that happens, okay, that happens once in a while. But then you have two eggs of, uh, of mother and one eggs of father, you get three eggs. And triploids are sterile. So you need you need the, the even a rarer situation in which you have unreduced gametes on one side and unreduced gametes on the other side. Unless, and that's the case that I explained about the ABI, uh, natural hybrid of banana, this plant is, it, it doesn't mind because it can produce itself vegetatively. And if it has habits, if it has some, some features that makes it unique, or advantages in nature, it will keep its position. If the triploid is, is very bad, is very poor, is very bad, and so forth, and depends only on seed, it will disappear. If you have a triploid Arabidopsis, or let's say a, a tomato, that's better. My colleague Michael Corney told me in nature you will not find triploid tomato because there are. Is that an Ayuri exception? But anyway, in, in, the, in, the, in the field, you will not find them because they're very sterile, they're very weak, right? Triploids, trisomics, and so they are weak, they grow slowly, and so forth. Ah. <laughs> Okay, 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 very good, very good. Thank you, Punya P. Well, the, this is an interesting question. Why do plants not have polyploids? Let's, let's say human. 
Human has no polar points. Human has no haploids. Human has no trisomics, except chromosome 21, which is the smallest in complement, except for the XYY, the XXX, and the XXY. So there are four or five different exceptions. All these exceptions of aneuploidy are chromosomes that have almost no gene, or they are full of repetitive sequences like Y chromosome. Still, it does not answer your question. The answer to the question is that animal chromosomes have a complete other mechanism of gene dose compensation. It is very essential that in human, human, this, this was studied best, you need two copies of a gene, no more, no less. I remember one very interesting paper in which they look for a gene amount, gene, uh, the amount of gene products when you have Down syndrome with one extra copy of chromosome 21. It's a very, very small chromosome. Now, only very few genes. But you see, this very small gene, chromosome, sorry, chromosome, has an effect on all the other chromosomes in which genes are upregulated, downregulated. In other words, even if chromosome 21 is extra, you see it completely regulates the balance function of many genes. In other words, uh, gene dose compensation in mammals, including men, is very strictly organized, except for the X chromosome. Because the ladies here, they have two X chromosomes, and one is inactive. The men, as one X chromosome always have reactive and the Y chromosome. So men and human, men and women are essentially the same, roughly. It is not 100% what I said, but it is roughly the same. We have both have one functional X chromosome. In plants, it's completely different. Plants do not have this very strict gene dose compensation mechanism. That is why trisomics and triploids. And haploids in plants are viable, physiological, metabolically verifiable. I'm not talking about fertility and sterility. That's another issue, right? That is what I explained in my lecture. But we talk about the physiology. A plant does not uh, suffer from one, two, three, four, or many copies of a chromosome or a gene. It still keeps working until a certain extent, right? I mean, we should not think about aridopsis more than six copies. Then you will see the plant get smaller and smaller. But in general, plants are very tolerant to multiple doses of the, gene, of the chromosome. Are you happy with this answer? Theoretically, yes, but I wonder if that is not much more work than just calculus. You may expect that the, that the triploid, the tetraploid, for certain genes have a higher transcription and more progress. But there is another thing that I already mentioned in the beginning of my lecture. Plants ha have endopolyploidy far more than mammals. Do we have endopolyploidy in mammals? Yes, nerve cells have. Very few cell tissues, tissue, sorry, have endopolyploidy. In plants, you have a lot of endopolyploidy. You, you remember that example of lupulus that I mentioned? There's another, if you look at Arabidopsis, you have the trichomes, they're the hairs, really. The trichomes are highly polyploid, endopolyploid. The endopolyploidy is natural. So it is tricky to use for a gene amount of gene products to see if you can make an estimate for polyploidy. It is an I would say it is a theoretical approach, a theoretical study which might be interesting, but not for establishing the polyploidy level.